Okay, here we're going to look at standard forms for absorbing Markov chains. So we're not going to do anything uh, too intense in terms of computations. Just talk about, again, putting, putting these matrices in standard form. So suppose we've got a transition diagram uh, like I have here. We've got A, B, C, and D, four states. It actually turns out, right, that there would be 24 ways to arrange this transition matrix. I mean, up till now, I think almost all of my examples, we've just had A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, right? And however you label the column, you'll label uh, the same in the same order. But there's no reason we have to do it alphabetically. If I wanted to, I could have B, and then D, and then A, and then C. There's no reason that I couldn't do that as well. Okay, so there's lots of different orderings that we could do. And again, for this particular transition matrix, or for this particular transition diagram, I should say, there's going to be 24 ways to arrange the transition matrix. And again, that just comes from the multiplication principle uh, when using counting techniques, right? There's, if you think about the first, the first entry, there's four letters to choose from. Well, when we pick the next one, we've got three left over. With the next one, we've got two left over. And then we've only got one choice for the last one. And that's going to give us four factorial. So again, in general, however many states you have, you'll just have that number of states factorial. Okay. All right, well, so there's lots of different ways to label. What we're going to talk about, again, is standard forms. So a little definition, and then we'll put a, a matrix in standard form. So a transition matrix for an absorbing Markov chain is in standard form if, if the rows and columns are labeled so that all the absorbing states precede the non-absorbing states. So we're just going to write the absorbing states first. So obviously, uh, there could easily be more than one standard form. Okay, so it's not unique necessarily. And once we put our matrix in standard form, we can even break it up into little four little sub-matrices. In the top left corner, uh, we're going to have the identity matrix. And again, the A is going to refer to the absorbing states. N will refer to the non-absorbing states. So we've got our identity matrix in the top left corner. and the top right, we're going to have just a bunch of zeros. And the bottom left, we're going to have a matrix. We'll call that R, label it as matrix R. And then uh, in the bottom right, we'll have a matrix Q. These matrices R and Q, we're going to need to use these in order to help us find the limiting matrix. Um, so, so R and Q will be important. All right, so no biggie here. Let's uh, let's take this this uh, this transition matrix and put it in a standard form. We'll also label the sub matrices R and Q. All right, so the first thing I want to do is simply pick out my absorbing states for this matrix. And in this case, it looks like the absorbing states. It looks like, well, there's a 100% probability from B to go from state B to go back to state B. So B is an absorbing state. And likewise, state C, it says there's a 100% probability that you'll go back to state C. So therefore, our non-absorbing states will be the other two, in this case, A and D. All right, so now it's uh, nothing at all difficult. So I'm going to write my absorbing states first. I could use C and B or B and C. It doesn't matter. I'm going to keep it uh, at least alphabetized from here. So B and C will come first. So again, I'm going to label the exact same way, B and C. And then again, I could either put A and D or D and A. It doesn't matter. So I'll use A and D, A and D. And now it's just simply a matter of just matching up values from before. So it said to go from B to B, there was a 100% probability, and zeros to go from it to any other state. It says if you're in state C, there's a 100% probability that you'll go back to state C. And again, zeros everywhere else. 
Okay, so let's see. It says to go from A to B, there's a 0.3 probability. So from A to B, we'll put 0.3 there. To go from A to C, again, is 0.3. To go from A back to A is 0. To go from A to D is 0.4. And now we just have to do the same thing with D. So it says to go from D to B, it says there's a 0.1 probability. Put that back in there. Okay, so from D to B is 0.1. Again, D to B is 0.1. Let's see, next we've got to find from D to C. So D to C is also 0.1. From D to A, well, let's see, from D to A, that's 0.8. And then from D to D, that was equal to 0. So now we have A standard form. And again, notice if we break this up, just like we had it a second ago, Notice we have our identity matrix in the top left corner. In the top right, we have all the zeros. And then we have these matrices, again, that we're calling um, R and Q. So in this case, the submatrix R would have entries 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. And our matrix, the other one we called it, again, Q, so matrix Q, our submatrix C, that has entries 0, 0 0.4, 0 0.8, and 0. And again, these two matrices are going to be important in helping us find our limiting matrix. So, uh, so this is going to be something that we'll start doing, is we're going to label, we're going to put things in standard form, we're going to label, and then we're going to do some stuff with these. So uh, let's even go ahead and talk about, talk about this real quick. And then in the next video, we'll actually go about doing a concrete example. So eventually what we want to do, again, is we want to find these limiting matrices for absorbing Markov chains. So this is the idea of why we did uh, all the stuff we just did. So if a standard form P for an absorbing Markov chain is partitioned as follows, so just like we had a second ago, it says then P to the power of K, that's going to approach a limiting matrix P bar as k increases. So if we start looking at powers of the matrix P, that's going to approach some limiting matrix. And again, that's, that's the whole idea here, is finding this limiting matrix. Well, how do we go about finding this limiting matrix P bar? Well, we've got a nice little formula, actually. It says P bar is going to equal the following. So the limiting matrix, you'll still have the identity in the top left. You'll still have zeros in the top right. You'll also find that you have zeros in the bottom right. But in the bottom left, we're going to get uh, a, a matrix. And to calculate this matrix, we take F and multiply it by our matrix R. So we had R labeled just a second ago. Well, how do we find this matrix F? Well, we use this formula. It says what we do is we take the identity matrix. We subtract away the matrix Q from that. Okay, so we take the identity matrix minus Q. And again, the identity matrix uh, is going to change. It obviously has to be the same size as the matrix Q. So we'll have an identity matrix the same size as Q. We'll take the identity minus Q. And then we'll find the inverse of that matrix. That's what we call matrix F. Once we have that new matrix F, which is called the fundamental matrix, what we do with that new matrix F is we multiply it by that, that original matrix R, and that's going to give us the entries in the bottom left corner. So that's why we need these matrices R and Q. So again, uh, Q is going to help us find F, and then we take F and multiply it by R, and again, that's going to give us our values, some of the values in our limiting matrix. Okay, so. All right, so that's all I want to do in this one. In the next video, I'm going to talk about a couple important properties of this limiting matrix, and then we'll actually do a concrete example.